Hi, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I speak with an artist here in Madison who makes things out of bones, jewelry, uh, other sort of things to wear and uh, pieces out of bones. And actually one particular bone that I finally, after it's mentioned like once or twice, I had to ask the person to elaborate on. So you'll have to listen for what that is. It's a fascinating story. The person lives here in Madison, has a storefront, uh, sells on Etsy, does markets. And we talk all about how they got started with bones in the first place. And oddly enough, it began with cosplay. So here's my interview starting right now. My name is Hilary Falk and my company's Fovia Works and I make natural science bone jewelry. I was going to ask you how you would describe what it is you do. Like, is, yeah. is there an actual format or like, what, what would you call that? Like, like when you call something like romantic works or medieval works or things like that, like, is there, is there an actual title or definition or genre that yours is like, what's the name? What would the name for that be? Well, fortunately, there's been a lot of terms that kind of start to fit what I feel like my jewelry has started out as and turned into. Okay. It, I feel like a lot of these words appeared during the pandemic in hashtag form. Um, All right. You know, I think maybe cottage core was like the first one. Oh, I like where, that. Yeah. Where everyone's like, oh, we're homesteaders. And everyone's like, oh, we're going to make our own sourdough bread and broth. And like, you know, we're going to prepare for the apocalypse. And but we're going to make it cute. Right. So it's kind of like a cute, um, almost like grandma kind of aesthetic. It's, yeah, but cottagecore also sounds like some sort of folk rock death metal, you know? Right. <laughs> it, it, it does capture a sort of like rugged, like the gross side of pioneering. Like, yeah. die of cholera. Like, I feel like there's a <laughs> to it. Yeah. So I, that kind of fits. Mm -hmm. Like what doing here, which is like making bones pretty. Like putting sparkles on cow teeth and, you know, like combining pink opals and like uh, penis bones. Like, you know, <laughs> like, I feel like maybe that's something that sort of approaches like defining it. But I don't know. Then there's now like there's gremlin core. There's gnome core and mm. vulture core. Like it's getting a little bit absurd. Yeah. But, like, no, the first one I still like better. I think I like cottage core. Yeah. That's cool too. And it also kind of sounds like some weird food. Like if, if cottage, like if cottage cheese was actually a vegetable. And so when you were done with it, all that was left was the cottage core. Oh yeah. You know, right. Based on how I think foods look in their natural state before they're harvested, you know, like I, you could just tell me that and I would believe you. I'd be like, yeah, that's how cottage cheese happens. It's like, it's a lumpy tree or. Yeah. You know, whatever. Yeah. I'm still I'm still all confused on what's a vegetable and what's not uh, a lot of the time. Like they're the obvious ones, but there's some where it's like, oh, no, that's actually a vegetable. But uh, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. we don't need to get into that. But um, yeah. so you're based in uh, Madison. Are you are you from Madison or where are you originally from? Uh, I spent most of my childhood in Sun Prairie. So, you know, oh, OK, to Madison, um, you know, to me, it was the big city and it, it still is a perfectly acceptable sized city. Yeah. Uh, I went to college in the Twin Cities for, and I stuck around there for about 15 years. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Just a little over a year ago, I moved back to Madison. Wow. Um, and why so did you move back? My family is here. Okay. And it's a little more like the cost of living is a little more reasonable um, in Madison versus the Twin Cities. Oh, really? Yeah. I'd say rent is a little lower. Um, you get like more for what you pay for here. And also just like having my family nearby is just really great. Okay. I've got a niece and a nephew and they're amazing. And I, I like being able to see them more now that they're like, you know, talking awesome humans. Like it's right. just, it's hard to not take the opportunity to be nearby. Yeah. And when you were in Minneapolis and going to school, you obviously didn't go to school for 15 years. You stuck around after school. Right. Yes, uh, I did. <laughs> how did, uh, how, how did you get started or like what kind of stuff were you doing with what you make or were you already making the, the jewelry and work that you do now uh, hmm. when you were in Minneapolis? So I went to school for clothing design initially. All right. Uh, 
So my focus was costumes. That was my main interest. Okay. Um, I will be totally transparent. It's definitely because of cosplay, like like anime, you know, costume. Okay. Like my entry point for like maybe a career could you know, like maybe making costumes for a living could be a possibility. Wait, so, wait, let me ask. Okay, the logic behind this. I, I get cosplay. Yeah. I see it a lot. I'm a comic book guy. I, I see the cosplay. I, I'm also, I like animation and anime. Now you're saying you saw it as a business choice. Is there really, like, is there a a actual career path in this? Like, I understand hobbyists and people that are really good at it and passionate mm -hmm. about it. But is there actually, like... You're saying you, you were like, maybe this is something I could do. Like, like what was the thought process behind that? Because I don't know about the actual people that make it. I just am aware right. and around it. Yeah. Well, in the U.S. or I guess like just North America as a whole, there's very few professional cosplayers. Okay. Like um, the most successful one I can think of would be Yaya Han. And she has her own line of fabric in her own section in Joanne Fabrics. Like what? all of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. She's like, she is excellent at what she does. And she's one of the original, like, famous cosplayers. Like, when the internet was still getting getting up into, like, its full community mode that it is now. Yeah. Um, you know, with LiveJournal even, or just, like, forums, you know, where mm -hmm. people would talk about gathering at a convention or, you know, whatever nerdy thing they wanted to talk about. Um she was already like a, a pretty common name. Like people recognized her. She also had excellent skills as a costume artist. Okay. And so she was often brought on as a guest to be either a judge for costume contests or just like kind of a, um, just like a presence at events that I think made a pretty huge impact on like the North American cosplay scene. Okay. Yeah, so she's got patterns that you can buy, you know, like commercial patterns that are printed. She has books. She also is gorgeous. So she has like a calendar you can buy of her like super amazing costumes. Like her, her, um, she's done it right. And I know she works extremely hard. So I think that she's like the first one I could think of that's like, yes, gotcha. she's a cosplayer. And I know that there's other folks in the all over the world now that have figured out a way to put a career together with it. Mm -hmm. I kind of just feel like for me, it was not like, I'm like, this is all I'm ever going to do. I'm like, I know that this is very interesting. You saw an and interest I'm, and went forward with it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm like, I'm going to learn fashion design stuff. So maybe I could work for Target or I could work for Cirque du Soleil. I mean, <laughs> I didn't you know, it. potato, <laughs> potato, Target, <laughs> Cirque du Soleil. All right. Yep. Yeah. This was back when they were like, you know, in existence still and had, headquarters but um what i like about cosplay is you end up picking up a lot of skills like mm -hmm. along the way i would bet so, i'm not good at a lot of them but i mean if i had to style a wig i could okay. like you know it's just different than hair it's plastic so you have to like warm it up and there's all these weird techniques you know pre being able to get the right tools for it oh, yeah. you kind of just figured it out so it's very scrappy very like figure it out share your information and that translates into like a lot of like what I do now is you know people are like hey I figured out this technique for cleaning bones in an apartment without smelling like <laughs> you know you're there, a serial killer <laughs> yeah there's a gap here okay I, I understand warming up wigs yes, uh, how yes. does that then evolve into <laughs> the proper way to make the whitest bones oh uh, sure <laughs> well, I, guess, I guess it comes down to like how in love with the process are you like that for me? I'm like, Ooh, there's this end result I want, but I'm kind of more interested in like how you get there. So like, let's okay. deep dive, like let's hyper focus, <laughs> like let's change, like, let's see how, how other people do it. So, um, and I guess the bridge between like, I like costumes and clothes. Mm -hmm. They are cool. I want to learn how to make them and like digging around inside of a deer head, you know, is um in between there i actually had a job outside of college at a company called b corporation and they were the company that did either restoration or building for like sesame street live all of the mascot costumes for lots of theme parks all over the world neat so okay. it was like the synthetic version of what i do now so we're like we're talking like cookie monster eyeballs versus like actual <laughs> eyeballs. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, like you get, but like it's repetitive work, but it's like skilled and very specialized repetitive work. Oh, sure. And I loved it. So I kind of, you know, anytime like something's like, hey, you want to learn how to whiten bones? I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. So it's just sort of like, kind of like where that part of my career really like I just loved that part of it. Who was the person that approached you with this idea? You made it sound like somebody came up down the street and said, "Hey, hey, you, <laughs> you want to learn how to whiten bones?" <laughs> I, I think that in Minneapolis, there's a little bit more of a bone jewelry is like kind of already been done. Okay, kind of seen. Um, I've got some friends who do bone jewelry. Um, we've got some like aesthetics that. Like kind of our inspiration is coming from the same place. So, but like even back in like the nineties, you'd see someone just like at a pop-up event with some gnarly cat bone jewelries or whatever. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of just like a, I guess a little more commonplace in the twin cities just for my observation or like the feedback I've gotten from people. Um, But there's always people who are like, I don't know, like, hey, I heard you know how to sew. So you either get requests or like, oh, I heard you know how to dye stuff. Can you over dye some pants? You know, like the request just sort of like, usually if you're turning them down still, it sort of adds up. It's like, maybe I could learn how to do that. Or like, I see that there's some sort of demand for uh, repairing dance costumes, like Mm -hmm. in a way that they could be worn to a wedding or like I don't know just just some just lots of strange overlaps in different categories that if you know how to just be a generalist or you're like super stubborn like I am and willing to just maybe figure out a way to do it um I don't know it can lead to some interesting places and I think this is how I ended up making jewelry to begin with well and it kind of sounds too like you enjoy the not outliers, not the extreme, but the the unconventional. Like even with you were like, okay, fashion design. Well, I'm, what about cosplay? Like that's a very specific, uh, you know, out outlier. I can't think of the right word, but but you know what I mean. Not the normal one. Yeah, and and then right. you were like jewelry, but what about jewelry that is you know with bones. and stuff you were like there were people that do it and you're like well i'm going to do this version of it rather than the version that everybody else knows um is what it sounds like to me but now let's get down to the real thing so okay with fashion design you can just go like you said to joanne fabrics and there's even like a display of the cosplay person's fabric so let's talk about supply and demand in the world of creating things out of bones and skulls uh, so how do you, <laughs> how do you, uh, find your, like, if people buy it, you need to get more, where are you getting said bones and stuff? Well, you know, it started out a little bit boring and it, and it's now become more interesting how I get it. Like right before we started the interview, I had to remember to stick a plastic bag in my mailbox because someone is coming by to deposit some chicks and, um, mice into my mailbox like okay. they, people bring me stuff people volunteer to bring me stuff sometimes it's not even like a question or a choice sometimes i get stuff people will put it in my yard like and tell me <laughs> <after> the facts <laughs> like, wait this sounds like some character on like some some uh, uh you know youth teen book where it's like that's the woman's house where everybody throws the bones you know and then they, yeah. your house gets visited on halloween and then you actually turn out to be a nice person and then they all become friends anyway i just yeah. wrote the book for you there you go i <laughs> love it you just grabbed the plot of at least one anime that i love probably nice. um like I don't know. Luckily, I'm on the east side of Madison, where I don't think you can out weird your neighbor. Like we're yeah. all weird over here. Yeah, it's I'm on a little block. Everybody knows who I am. They all know that I'm, you know, like the weird stuff I'm dumping into the sewer, like that I have to use a cart to bring because it's like big. Um, they are just like, oh, that's just the maceration juice for the deer heads. Like that's not toxic. It's just stinky. Like. <laughs> It's fine. There are so many things that you just talk about where you're just like, and you know, the stuff I have to dump into the sewer. You talk about it like you're just like, oh, and I had to wash the dishes. You know, it's It's also like, I don't know. It comes down to my yard is small. If I dump too much liquid in it of any kind, like if I run a sprinkler, it's going to flood my yard. Okay. And 
I just don't really think anyone wants standing water like creeping under the fence that smells like a porta potty. So I take it to the sewer and it's just it's like just whatever works for my environment, like yeah. my adaptations to what I have to work with, um don't usually make any sense. But to me they be because it's like a lot of repetition, I'm just like, this is just what I do. And right. everyone's like, that's just what she does. And then we're all like, okay, that's just this is just what happens over here. But yeah, it's it's interesting to maybe talk about it you know to someone who doesn't witness that or do it right and exactly totally ridiculous so you have the neighbors already like going okay hey we just had thanksgiving dinner let's dump the bones in her yard um but <laughs> i mean there had to be some sort of method in which you started out where you couldn't just rely on the kindness of neighbors and friends um, yeah so so when you were in minneapolis like how did you like when you first started making this this jewelry uh mm -hmm. how did you how did you go about acquiring it? Or is there, is there like an Amazon equivalent of a place that you can go to find these things? Or do you have to go find them yourselves? Uh, I know that you refer to scavenging a lot on, yeah. on your posts. So please <laughs> explain that. <laughs> sure. So I guess the very first thing I ever found and decided I could make something with this was I had, I mean, I would go for walks on the train tracks with my husband to look at graffiti because there's this awesome like small bridge that mm -hmm. had like a gallery's worth of really great graffiti. So we were taking walks and we would notice that predators had been taking stuff there to, to snack on. Okay. And it's like the perfect environment for it to become very perfectly nature cleaned. So there were bones that were ready to just pick up, you know, give a little wash and then use. Um, Completely so normal. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, see other people walking on the train tracks and i know that some of them are looking for bones especially in the twin oh really cities. okay yeah yeah so twin cities it's just like that's where you get your bones and you can do it in an urban environment uh i was pretty excited most of the stuff i was finding was either in my yard or within a mile radius of my urban apartment yeah so like i'd be walking down a busy street and there'd be a pigeon sitting there looking at me but then i would realize it was not an alive pigeon like it was it was supplies yeah so, supplies. You know, it's, it was, it's so morbid it was, but that's what it is yeah 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 so just train tracks is a great place to start i don't like to tell kids that because you're not supposed to be on train tracks good point not safety good. first kids when collecting your bones right don't get hit by a train <laughs> You know, like be safe. Also, like trespassing is wrong, but that's how I get some of the bones. Is I'm probably trespassing, you know, to a yeah. certain degree. Um, you know, also even collecting roadkill is considered not necessarily um, legal. I guess depending on where that roadkill is. Well, I guess I it, never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah, it totally varies from state to state. And, you know, are you on a driveway of someone's property? Are you on the highway? You know, it kind of that determines if it is up for grabs or not or if you just need to be stealthy about it you know i'm not like taking bald eagles off the side of the road i know which stuff is legal to have or possess or is safe you know i'm not touching bats or anything that could carry diseases i'm as careful as i can be with deer because of chronic wasting disease um but all of this is really just from like that that fateful walk on the train tracks where I'm like, Ooh, bones. Oh my gosh. There's a lot of bones here. Like then I would come back and I'd start to find other things. And I started to get a little more bold about like, you know, I think I could maybe clean this up a little bit. Uh -huh. Maybe I could ask some of my friends what they think this is. And we identified a Fox and I'm like, what? There's foxes out here. We're like in a city. So it started to get more and more interesting. Okay. Like, just the accidental stuff I was learning, like about like my own environment, like the flowers that grow there, the birds that are there, because I'd find feathers on the tracks too, that okay. were like neon yellow. I'm like, what on earth are these doing here? There's not any native species that have yellow feathers, are there? Well, there are. And I'd like learning about it. I don't know. It was just fun. It made me feel more connected to like the environment I was in. Um, I'm like a city and suburb girl. Like I don't do a lot of nature stuff. So it started to become really cool. Like yeah. just learning about all of these things and interacting with them, whether or not it's like washing them or whatever, whatever, you know, icky process ends up happening. 
Um, and then also like once everything's finished and like beautified and like it's interacting with people who are shopping, um, seeing their connection to it too is like a yeah. whole nother level. It's just, it's super interesting. And I did not expect it to be like that. It just ended up kind of happening. Huh? Yeah. That's what it sounds like. And also the, ex yeah. the expanding on it, like learning the, 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 uh, expanding on the environment thing is kind of an interesting twist. I, <laughs> I was not expecting yeah. that. Yeah. It's definitely reverse engineering. We're starting at the point of like death and decay. Right. And we're on our way back. So I'm like, and you're like, Oh, look at all this pretty stuff that's around the bones. <laughs> totally. Totally. I'm like, this is amazing. Like death huh. is kind of just part of the whole like it's necessary you know it's just it's like a rock some moss some bones like once you start to look you're just gonna find them they're everywhere like okay. you really don't have to look hard to start finding dead stuff all over the place so okay. and now yeah. when you when you find these things and you look at them are you looking at them going like, Oh, I could do this with that. Or, you know, how do how do you know what to pick up? Or I suppose after a while, there are certain bones, you know, that you can recreate it in a way that you had before. But when yeah. you look at them, do you go, these would be perfect for earrings or these, or I could do this with like, like what's the process of like uh, starting one of your projects that you do yeah. with one of these bones? Um, because I'm still relatively new to it. I'm still kind of in the, Oh yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Um, but there, there's been some hard fails that okay. I know I should just kind of avoid entire species or whatever. But yeah, I have like a palette I've developed things that I know work well Makes and sense. also hold up well. Yeah. Okay. Because there's, there's other pieces too that I have to consider. Um, is it, does it translate well to a shopper? There's certain, like I've worked with 70 million year old, uh, dinosaur fossil bones. Really? And they're, to me gorgeous but they're this like unassuming brown color they're they just don't look you don't know what you're looking at okay so it's been hard that's been hard but like a big you know honking humorous like that that reads as like a caveman bone people are like whoa what is that and they're like drawn in and they're really interested and they think it just you know it's like visually appealing yeah. so visually appealing part of my palette how stable is it for the process that i will put it through like um, I was collecting entire cicadas for a while, but their bodies just rot and fall apart and their oh. wings, their wings are super strong. They hold up for, you don't have to refrigerate them. The bodies like smell horrid. So yeah. I just started to just immediately just collect the wings. So like I only work with the wings for cicadas. Oh my God. You're the kid that pulled the wings off of bugs. <laughs> <laughs> they're dead does that make it any no, better wait when they're dead like i guess i've only ever seen the shell of them right uh, so I, I guess i've never actually seen dead cicadas i've only just been like oh that's the shell maybe it wasn't i guess yeah i just yeah. assumed that was sort of um huh. i still have only ever found like one cicada like ever um it's totally and sometimes their wings will just be like drifting off, like just oh. the wings. So something got to them first. But I have a friend who is a dog walker and she and the help of her dogs would find all sorts of stuff for me, including like piles of like dead cicadas and stuff. <laughs> so she was one of my first like friends. Worst Scooby-Doo episode ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm away with it. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like I'm guessing there's mass die-offs um okay. sometimes it's just a total mystery like why on earth is this thing here like is this a human created event or is nature just doing crazy nature stuff and right just witness it and maybe shove it in a ziploc bag and take it home like right <laughs> yeah so okay. there's certain goals that i try to make like aesthetically is it gonna work have i worked with it before is it too cool to pass up and is it huge? And is it going to be a problem? Mm -hmm. Like, I found a fox on the side of the road not too long ago. It was a juvenile fox, but I have to make the assessment, like, how long has it been there? Will it fit in my freezer? You know, like, can <laughs> it be a um, <laughs> Like, it, yeah. I'm it, glad you it, find it, the humor in this. If you were more oh, straight-laced yeah. about that last yeah, statement, I would be very sure. concerned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what works for people too. When I'm at like an art fair or a music festival with vegans, you know, being, 
beautiful and vegan and I'm here with like the slaughterhouse of like right. my jewelry. But it's nature slaughterhouse. It's not like yeah. you're not causing it. It's Yeah, uh, it's an already nature did the slaughter and I'm just there to like pick up the beautiful leftovers, you know. Right. The, the framework from a life. But people, I think because I'm usually so like stoked to talk about, you know, whatever. <laughs> I got you. Okay. Course, you know, like, it kind of like is disarming. And I'll, I'll make like an effort to wear the most colorful, like clownish clothes, like clothing I can wear. Oh, that's so smart I look actually. Full and like just, it makes it like cuter and more cottage core. Like that's just something I've noticed. Yeah. Like, I'm like morose and like hiding, like, I think people don't want to come over. Like it is way less appealing to them. Okay. Yeah. Cause I don't think it has to be goth. Like I think it can be accessible to lots of different people. Like kids love it. I've had grandmas walk away with like penis bone necklaces and they're like, I'm going to wear it to work. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> you like, said you penis know? bone twice now. So I need yeah. to ask about this. <laughs> the materials I work with the most is because it is the most popular and, the weirdest looking. Um, so the the scientific term would be for a single one be baculum or bacula or okay. plural. And I guess most mammals have one. It's just something humans evolved out of having. Okay. But they I was unaware. Yeah, that was a new that was like a fun fact that I learned in reverse, because I think I was like at a like an oddity shop digging through you're bones. like this is the weirdest looking femur i've ever seen <laughs> yeah, like, that's no femur and they, there's like nicknames especially for the raccoon baculum because it has this very unique shape and yeah. it's super sturdy and like shockingly big for an animal that small <laughs> you look at it you're like no i don't i'm very uncomfortable right now but um it's used in a lot of like mountain man like activities like it's actually incorporated into the moon shining still it's like popped oh. in the end like to kind of like wick the moisture out so hmm. um and there's some like mountain man like i've heard it's a charm of some kind it can be whittled to be a toothpick. well that i'm not surprised about there's a the whole thing about the rhino's horn and all that kind of stuff too yeah that it, that part doesn't surprise me it, it being actually associated with the, its original purpose but the, sure. the moonshine thing is a new one to me like yeah. yeah that's weird yeah and people were able to identify them because i guess there was like a pbs um special on moonshine. that'll do it yeah <laughs> so there was like some exposure that i didn't know about but now i know about it because lots of people told me and then you know i had this little cute bowl full of like just bacula and people would be buying them for white elephant gifts but i noticed like the bowl emptied out very fast after that pbs you know <laughs> like, it's like a bag of chips <laughs> yeah, and like they get to pick their own and that is so delightful you know it's this tactile bonanza is fishing through a bowl of okay. different sized raccoon bones like um yes it's it's definitely like one of the things that also draw people in because like my pieces are small and weird and one of a kind so like there's no it looks like a sad weird garage sale unless you have something to get you a little bit closer so you can actually like figure out what you're looking at. Yeah. And the bowl of, you know, raccoon bacula generally is like something that will rein people in and they'll be like cracking jokes, but then here they are, like shopping and it just it it's an accidental strategy. But um the the best thing is when my mom is helping me because she is like just the coolest and my dad too like uh -huh. both of my parents will just show up and be like you want a break or they'll just you know mm. like just run support and and like and inevitably it's like a very penis bone heavy day like conversationally and, and like, you're talking about it like at pop-up events and markets and stuff right yes. okay yeah so like any larger market where there's just a lot of people or it's a day where there's just a lot of talking and maybe I might need a break. My mom will show up and help like so I can go get a break. But I'm like, mom, you don't have to you don't have to talk about the bowl of of raccoon penis bones. You do not. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> have to? <laughs> More like want to. <laughs> Why would right. you not? Right. 
I mean, I think you don't the, have to bring anything else. Just set your table up and put a bowl in the middle and go, yeah. guess what this is? Yeah, um, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe for Valentine's Day, I could really kind of hone in on that. <laughs> yeah. There's different, you know, like I just got some mink bacula and they are quite nice and earring sized, you know, that would be very cute. I was unaware that the guy from Quantum Leap's last name was very similar to that, Scott Bakula. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it does raise some questions. It's interesting. Um, yeah. So, it's, and speaking of the markets, and I mean, that's how I heard about you. Uh, I saw you at one of the night markets here, and mm -hmm. that's, and I contacted you because I was like, well, she makes bones. I need to know more about that. Um, or not makes bones, makes jewelry out of bones. That's what I meant to say. Anyway, um, it, cool. <laughs> you make bones cool. Exactly. Uh, how did you get started with the markets? When did you actually start taking, or when did you decide like, I'm going to take these out and create a little, you know, pop up or, you know, market on the street at, at places? When did yeah. you start doing that? Um, so it started when I was still living in the Twin Cities. Um, this was, I think, yeah, before the pandemic. Okay. I was starting to get really interested in jewelry making and people were reaching out to me asking if they were for sale. So it was a lot of direct sales to friends and family um, without me marketing anything other than like posting pictures. Okay. Um, so you didn't even have an online shop at this point? No, I just had like my personal Facebook page and I would post really terrible quality pictures of stuff that I'd made and people were like, Ooh, can I buy it? And huh. it was kind of a surprise because yeah. it was, I guess I didn't go into it expecting it to become like a source of income. Yeah. I was hoping to maybe break even. And I'm very used to my hobbies never coming close to breaking even. Oh, like yeah, I tell have me about it. hobbies. Yeah. <laughs> you get into costuming and your money will just like start on fire and just you don't have any of it anymore. Like right. it's super expensive. Just make the um, fabric out of dollar bills. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Just like or gold, like some something absurd. Yeah. yeah. I mean, materials just in general nowadays are so expensive. I mean, that's kind of why I like bones is they're free, you know, they're, <laughs> they're free and you just go yeah, get them. But as at a, at a personal cost, but yes, they're free. Okay. I get you. <laughs> my, my bone related nightmares. Um, I don't know. And I, I have a hard time saying no to free stuff and okay. like, a challenge, especially a weird challenge. Um, so there's this organization in the Twin Cities called the Haunted Basement. Um, it The best way I could describe it would be like an art haunted house, like a theatrical haunted house. I like Thank that. You. All right. Yeah, it's great. It's a great collective of people. Um, they have had different locations. They literally did start in a haunted basement at the soap factory, which is a uh, old... And like partially condemned building that was like just a kind of standalone gallery, I would say. I can't remember when it started, but I mean, it was it was a pretty important part of the art scene in the right. Twin Cities. So the year that I got in contact with the Haunted Basement, they had taken over an entire Herberger's department store at a mall in a suburb of St. Paul. And so we're talking like the most amount of square footage you could imagine for a haunted house and then like room to store all their stuff like the dressing rooms were turned into these like all gender like blood like so because they were wearing lots of stage makeup and blood and it would just get everywhere and so you would go into these bathrooms and they're huge and at the very end at the, there'd be someone like with like a bird like artsy bird makeup with no shirt <laughs> being like Hi, like <laughs> seeing blood off their face, and I'm like, I love it here. But <laughs> they were like, okay, we have all this room. A lot of the people in this collective are gifted artists, you know, that have like these either side hustles or passions. Mm -hmm. Let's do a maker's market, and so I they mean, why not? Yeah, there, yeah, and there was foot traffic from the mall, like because it was a straight up major department store. So they'd open the metal gate put up their horribly awesome like giant like punk rock sign and people could just wander in and you know shop for all sorts of really great crafts like they weren't all spooky like we had some really amazing like um oh polymer clay like jewelry makers and okay. just 
people who were like super polished, but maybe just wanted to try a different venue with like a different audience. And um, I did my first market there with them and continued through their season while they were getting ready for their like big, like fall, you know, actual haunted main event. Okay. So it kind of got me started with markets and I really enjoyed it. And I was like, well, guess I'll keep, you know, signing up for more of these and just see what happens. Yeah. How many so, do you do a year? Um, It's kind of slowed down a little because of my move to Madison that sort of like interrupted the like repeat, you know, like I know when everything is in the Twin Cities, but not so kind of like catching up here in Madison. Gotcha. Okay. Um, But I think all things considered with the pandemic, I do like at least 10 a year. Okay, nice. It's not that many, but I mean, some of them are multi-day events and I would like to do more for sure. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's just the number I'm pulling up off the top of my head. Right. But quite a few. I'm just always curious how many people like markets are considered the thing that is their actual income maker. They rely on that. Whereas I'm more of a, I rely on online sales. Right. Sort of thing. Yeah. And and you have an Etsy shop too. Plus, oh, I want to ask about this. Um, when you look up your name on Google or the, the name of your, of your work on Google, um, there's a location for it. Do you actually have yeah. like a studio space or a storefront? So I live in the converted commercial building. So there is a storefront in my building. Um, it was used by a previous tenant as a bedroom, but I would not be comfortable with that because there's like big, we're, we're actually in my store right okay. now. Um, so it's used as like a spillover gallery. And um, I have my sewing equipment in here because I also do like vintage clothing repair. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, I do pop-up events here. So okay. I'll actually, there's a door that faces the street that, like there's no access to the the living quarters in my building. So people are able to actually come in through the street door. It's that red building there, right? Yes. Yeah. On the corner. Okay. I've driven by that many times. Okay. Yeah. And what I like about it is it's quite unassuming. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So I feel safe and um, you know, I've got, obviously my neighbors know me and uh, I've got a housemate who also is an artist who uses the um, other parts of the building for their work and um yeah it's cool like I feel really comfortable here um I've been a little more uh lax on doing the open studios but obviously because of the holidays I'm like we could probably like start these up back up again so I'm hoping to be able to do more and just kind of get back into the swing of doing that because it's fun like it's nice to meet my neighbors there's little to no pressure people to buy anything if they want to great otherwise like i just enjoy people well if they want to bring their dogs that's that's fine with me Um, (laughs) i just like have to remember to take the boxes of bones off the floor oh right yeah get a sniffer and they like just get face first into the the really crumbly bones that i have on the floor and i'm like yeah for them it's like a candy store okay that makes sense a lot like dogs really like my like kids and dogs so uh, I have to just be careful what I keep on the ground, like, cause I don't want anything to go in anybody's mouth that isn't supposed to be Makes there. Makes sense. Yes. But like, I like kids and dogs, so it works out. I just don't want anyone to eat, you know, part of my jewelry and end up with any issues for any party involved. Right. So, yeah. Um, so you also said before, like, uh, with this the thing that you do, you're not used to it actually making a profit. So how do you promote what you're doing? How are you getting, like, I know you have the Etsy store and I want to say also when I search for you, an ad shows up specifically for you when I search for you too. So you also do online advertising for yourself and things like that. Like what are some of the ways you promote yourself? Mm -hmm. I know that Etsy has like the default offsite, you know, kind of they like will do it. And you know, then if there's clicks, they charge you more accordingly if it leads to like a purchase. Um, so that's kind of not my direct doing. Okay. Um, Etsy, I was wondering about that. All right. Right. Yeah. And I did, I have uh, put a, a, quite a bit of money into advertising in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, 
I hate to say it, but like the pandemic did benefit me in certain ways. Right. Um, there were more accessible artists grants in my community and my husband and I were awarded one. And that opened up a lot of opportunities to like be able to pay models to like do a photo campaign and pay for advertising and really be consistent Yeah, and pay those dues like well in advance for a show that, you know, either has a juried fee or a higher, you know, like a higher um, market fee, you know, just kind of a little more opportunities. So that was really excellent to be able to utilize the money from that grant for stuff like how did, advertising. How did you find the grant? I'm always was, curious how to find these. Yeah, this one was, I think, advertised pretty well, but it was through the county that we lived in, in Ramsey County in uh, St. Paul. Okay. So um, I kind of wish it was that easy still. And, you know, I've signed up for grant emails and you know, all that, but it seemed a little more in your face during the pandemic. I feel like there was a bigger push to get the word out to people who maybe didn't think they were applicable for okay. grants. Like me, for example, I'm just, <laughs> I don't know. I've never applied for one. Is it hard to do? Well, no, it's not because they help you. They want to give you, they want you to be awarded the grant. Like there's organizations that I never had heard about. Um, it definitely kind of demystified applying for grants. So that was like a really cool experience. Um, it's a little harder to, you know, um, my attention for that wanes. It, it like ebbs and flows. And I'm in, a, I'm in a place right now where it's hard for me to sit down and do that. Like, let's research grants right. and figure out how to remember to apply by the deadline and all of that. Like that can be a pretty big challenge for me. But I also have a larger network of friends now here in Madison who are like, hey, did you apply for this thing? And it's it's sort of like a little social pressure or really helpful reminders because the community here is super kind to each other and like people will communicate opportunities to each other. So that helps yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Mine, I, I go either way. I go uh, either I hear about something and I sign up immediately, immediately and just write the whole thing out just in one fail swoop because I heard about it and I'm like, I'm going to forget about this later. Or I'm the, oh crap, did I miss the date for that? I have five minutes left and then madly try and put something together to get involved oh, yeah. with it. Yeah. It's never yeah. the, well, let me prepare for this. It's yeah. always either yeah, jump in blindly it. or hurry up before it goes away. Yeah, definitely. And like, I really appreciate the emails that are like, applications opening soon. I'm like, oh, but I want to do it right now. Like, can I do it right now? <laughs> With all this time? Like, because I'm, it's this moment may never happen again. <laughs> like, right. My enthusiasm will be yeah. far less involved next right. time. Yeah. And like, <laughs> every part of what it does has kind of like a season, you know, like in the summer, that is a lot of outdoor stinky stuff season and like if i'm outside and i'm like you know up to my elbows in whatever like i'm not on my phone like applying for things like i'm not sitting on my emails like i and that's it's a bad format for what i do because you have to be disciplined and stay on top of all of those aspects all the time year round so right i recognize that that is not a good way to do things but um I sometimes like don't have a choice. And like, if I don't get this stuff ready, we're like the first frost is coming and like, I can't, you know, it's going to just sit in my backyard for seven months or whatever. So I'm working on the kinks on that. Like that is something I'm definitely still very new at and like, right. In need of like discipline on for sure. Yeah. And well, aside from that, what other things would you say is the hardest part about, what you do, what's, what's like the most difficult thing as um, far as the, what you make and what you create and right. being an artist, I guess, let's yeah. just get really super general with it. Like what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's, that's, um, there's a lot of challenges as far as like the creative process goes. I mean, anybody who's found themselves as a full-time artist, there's always burnout, you know, in some part of the job, it's, 
it does come down to like, I mean, sometimes the only thing that will keep me going through something that I don't want to do, but I know must be done is like, I'm an athlete. Like I'm a professional, (laughs) but like there's something about athlete where I'm like, there's gonna, it's gonna hurt, but like, that's what athletes do. And it's just, it's like insane. So you motivate yourself by thinking of what athletes have to go through. Yes. I I don't mind that. That's pretty, I get that. Okay. Yeah. Because they have to keep motivated. Yes. All right. All right. That tracks. I get it. It it is uncomfortable. Like just the, um, sometimes my attention span or discipline for a certain aspect, like show prep is limited. So I have to just find workarounds and like finding those workarounds, like knowing what you can't cut corners on and knowing what you, you just, you can simplify or like you're, you're maybe overthinking it or you're putting too many resources into this. Like that's something that I'm, I would say is something I still have a lot to learn and that can be pretty hard. Um, but also just like being okay with making mistakes, you know, I've okay. finally started to have shows where I sell nothing and in an, or I work so hard, like just convincing people that I belong there or you know, like whatever over explaining or um, physical exhaustion comes from certain markets. Like for me, I have trouble when I'm in a bar setting, like some of um, just like the maker's market formats, how they can be in smaller pubs or distilleries. Yeah. Just ambient noise. Something about it is like, it just sucks my like energy out of me. And so it may not actually have been a difficult event, but I'm just like- But there's just a lot of like- I want to say facial noise, but that's not it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Over a lot of noise around. I don't know why I keep trying to think of words that are far more advanced than what I mean to say. (laughs) I've done that several times. It does come down to more than words. And that's another thing is like with the pandemic, like wearing masks, it's like, oh, I was really relying on like body language to like hear (laughs) people. Like I can't actually hear them unless I can see like what their face is doing. Oh, yeah. Or I can't tell if they're into this and if I'm, or if I'm just wasting my time and I should just say hello. I did and have I- to learn how, yeah, to be more expressive with your eyes. Like, cause I would do things where, you know, uh, even when you would walk by people, there's the standard, like you just kind of do a small, like uh, Mona Lisa grin at them. Like, you yeah. know, you just like make a mouth. But when you were wearing a mask, it's like, oh, I just looked at them and stared for a second, apparently to them. They didn't see my mouth do the little like, hey, how you doing grin. Yeah. So yeah. I had to like find a way to do that with my eyes. Like, Hey, yeah. you know, definitely. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of like weird communication adjustments that like, you know, um, probably certain habits haven't been undone. You know, maybe I'm like overly expressive now. Cause I'm there's like, nothing wrong with that. Mask. Yeah. It just, um, I'm an introvert. And so as much as I love going out into an unknown environment that is loud potentially not always um I like love it but I just I just get kind of tired you know I realize I'm like in my late 30s I have limited energy Mm -hmm. and um just kind of like just being realistic about that you know I can't go hard I can't make as many mistakes in that category or I have to buffer in time afterwards where I'm like the next day will be the sitting around and watching Netflix and like eating ice cream day like you know just gotta just got a budget time for that because like that's important too like people need to take care of themselves I can't just work all the time and that was another mistake that I'd made was I loved what I did so much when I first started doing this was uh, I would probably be like classed as a workaholic like I was just working all the time okay and not taking care of myself like With, resting. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, that is, I always try to work taking care of myself into that time because I, mm-hmm. I do like, I definitely am like what I do is what I want to be doing anyway. It just mm-hmm. so happens that it's also like, Oh, I got to find a way to actually make a profit off this. Yes. You know, it's otherwise, yeah. like if I wasn't making a profit, what would, you know, if I, if I quit doing this tomorrow, what would I be doing? Well, I'd be doing this. I just wouldn't be showing anybody. <laughs> you know, it's, that's, yeah. that's the weird thing. So it's easy to, to forget when you're trying to make a profit at it, that you have to try and do something for yourself. 
And yeah, so yeah. I always, I set aside an exact time every day where I'm like, okay, here's where, actually two times, where, here's where I'm going to do something not involved with this. And then mm -hmm. here's where I'm going to like exercise or do something like that, like go on a bike ride or work out or whatever. And that's, I, I stick to that every single day, no, no matter what. Yeah, that's like, I'm not even super great at regular meal times. So having like, yeah. Oh, I do that too. Yeah, no, but this uh, regular meal time. <laughs> <laughs> Although it is, it is one of those, uh, I'm a person that eats at like eight 30 at night. So it's, it's pretty, e yeah, yeah. A lot of people I know are that way, but you find out over the holidays, it's just like, you know, they're like, Oh, we'll meet at four 30 to eat. And it's like, what are we eating breakfast? What's happening right now? Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Thanksgiving, we had our meal at four and I'm like, I know we've had it earlier. Like, so I'm not going to complain. And, but four, four is approaching like, lunch for me like, <laughs> we're, right. we're not really yeah yeah like breakfast is something I will have to force myself to do can I assume it's you're like me then too where you do most like you live at night and during the day like noon is like your morning coffee <laughs> sort of yeah. thing okay good yeah. thank you I'm it, not the only one yeah it kind of <laughs> like went into that sort of I don't know like in the middle of like pure quarantine time in the pandemic I was going to bed every day at 11 and like waking up at 7 and that was not a problem but um, my night owl tendencies are like kind of coming back like teenager style like yeah. I feel like, I'm, like a teenager again as far as my ability to do stuff in the morning it's like very it's not great anymore yeah I, I don't get struck by inspiration until like 9 30 10 o'clock at night for some reason I don't know what it is yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I wanted to ask one more thing. Uh, what is, uh, some of the things you have coming up or some of the things people should know about that, uh, you have in the works, uh, other things like that. Yeah. Uh, so the next market that I have in Madison is the crafty fair on December 3rd. Um, I'm just going to be participating in it on Saturday. I know that it is, there's two days for the event, but mm -hmm. I'll be, just there on Saturday and I'm in the ironworks. Oh, I'm not familiar with that one. I think it's like part of the Goodman community center. Okay. Like, I think it's like a section of it. Um, so it'll be there. And then the next day on Sunday, December 4th, I'll be at the Aldo Leopold nature center. They're having a market there. Oh yeah. It's like Where's, a holiday. Bazaar. How far away is that? Um, that's kind of over in Monona. So, I mean, okay. not super far at all. It's just um, this nature center that I know is important to my family. Like they, you know, they have like nature camps and um, stuff for kids and families. And um, I think the touch exhibit aspect of what I usually bring is like just displays for my booth um, kind of caught the eye of one of the events coordinators there. So like, ooh, you know what? This could work. Like, let's, let's see if you want to do the holiday bazaar. And I, think that it's going to be super fun like okay. i'm really looking forward to it um just a lot of like more natural science or you know just uh, i see folks that are doing like i think essential oils like soaps you know just kind of like older school cottage core kind of like right I still and love i'm that not term. describing it well it's like just another awesome makers market and they have a variety of all sorts of makers there. Okay. And if people wanted to check out your work and what you do, where would they go? Uh, I'm most active on Instagram. So it's at phobia works. Uh, that's my Instagram. And I'm starting to get a little bit better at doing videos. I have a domestic beetle colony now that I've been doing a lot of videos involving. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's one that has, 42,000 views on it and I'm like why it's not I think it's the song that I put on it I'm still like befuddled by social media but I mean I've gotten more people looking at the rest of my Instagram so I I enjoy making the videos like they're trash but that's what <laughs> it's like my brand is trash so so I guess I do like it um but Instagram I kind of like post work in progress and finished pieces eventually it will end up on Etsy I am also I'd been focusing really hard on markets and also stocking stores that okay. I sell so um, Etsy does get beefed up more for the holidays okay 
Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm glad we got a chance to meet. Yeah, this was great. Thanks.